And to the David L. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network. In the studio now, we have Mr. Timothy S. Flanders, who's the editor-in-chief of Our Lady Victory Press and a producer of the media and content you find at the Meaning of Catholic Apostolate. How's it going, Timothy? Jesus is king. Can you hear me? Amen. Amen. All right. Awesome. Thanks for coming in, man. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you always, David. How you doing? Yes, sir. Hey, um, how's your Lent going? Oh, it's a blessed Lent. It's, it's great. Uh, how's yours, yours going? Yeah, it's, 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 it's going awesome, man. I was talking earlier about, um, you know, it's the second week of Lent. So, you know, the readings are oriented towards, um, you know, obedience and trust. You know, we were talking about Abraham and um in the in apostles on the Mount of Transfiguration. So um so yeah it's definitely something I'm working on. I think the one thing that I've been trying to work on this Lent was I've been trying to pray the um um the office um every morning, right? And so not going great, right? But I, I noticed that I think I'm at three days a week now and I noticed that the more you pray the office, the more you develop a, a prayerful attitude. I find myself praying more throughout the day by developing this habit of prayer. Yeah, definitely. It's it's great when you can get into really habituate that, that virtue Yeah. so that it, it feels like you are missing something if you haven't done it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, good habits. And um, so, man, I'm excited to have you on the show today to talk about culture, because I know we had talked a little while ago and I know you're working on a book. And um, so, but man, culture is like a huge conversation. I mean, you have, you have cancel culture, you have Catholic cultures like the Irish, German, you have, you have pop culture, you have culture sometimes associated with race. So like, oh, you know, this race has a certain culture. Um, some people have culture, right? And some don't, right? Sometimes you say, oh, yeah, this person has, he's cultured, which means they're refined or something like that. Um, but, you know, great conversations have great definitions. Define culture. Well, my definition of culture comes from the, in my opinion, the greatest Catholic historian of the 20th century, Christopher Dawson. And it's my attempt to summarize his work uh, which is essentially culture breaks down to four elements. Okay. The first and most important element is cultus, which is a religious rite, a religious ritual, which forms the community. And this is completely universal. Every single culture before 1776 has, before even the Dutch Revolution in 1581, uh, has a, a public cultus, a public a public right. You have the Persian Empire, the Zoroastrians, Roman Empire had the paganism, uh, the Christian Empire had Christian rights. It, it's all over. So you have the cultus. That's the most important part. From that flows everything else. And then you have uh, tradition, which in, in which includes everything that's passed down whatsoever. So that ever, goes everything from morals to cuisine to music to dance, everything that's passed down. The third element is elders. There is a certain office in the culture whose job is to guard that tradition, pass it down to the next generation. And then the fourth element is piety. And piety is the obligation of the next generation to revere their ancestors and receive that tradition and pass it down. So I submit that based on this definition, what we live in is actually an anti-culture because mm. it does, it's, it's missing – First of all, the cultus, it's, it's anti-tradition. It was founded in America and various liberal societies on a rebellion against certain aspects of the tradition. And that's why, especially in the 20th century, you have these different uh, demarcations of generations. You have, oh, it's the greatest generation. Oh, it's the boomer generation. Every generation is recreating itself, which is anti-culture it's not it, the the generations are disintegrating parents wow. uh, you know children are rebelling against parents parents against children there's this there's this disunity between these generations and that's that's the effect of anti-culture 
Wow. So run down those 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 four points again. What are the, the, the those four keys to culture? Yeah. So the most important part is cultus, which is a religious right. And so cultus is also related to cultivate. Uh, but it's just a religious right of any kind. It's just supplicating the supernatural in the in as a part of the public act of the people. Okay. Uh, and so then you have the cultus. You've got the tradition. Everything passed down. You have the elders whose is office to do that passing down. Everything from parents to priests. And then you have the piety, which is the the next generation. They have to receive that, pass it down with reverence. Well, you know, you just helped me out. A, a whole lot. I want to. I want to build on this some more. Is I, I've been having a conversation with people, and it, it, they don't. They don't believe me when I tell them that Black Americans we don't have a culture. We don't. We don't. There's no. There's no such thing as a Black. Well, there's no such thing as a Black culture in the United States because um, I, I was just looking at it in in the sense of it was missing. So I, I, I think culture um, has some key elements. I wasn't looking at like like you were. I was looking at in, in a more sense. Well, I think during slave times, I think there arguably, I think there's we could say that um, the blacks who were in slavery, I think they there was a slave culture. I was looking at there's a way one there's a way that they did things. There was something that they produced, right? Um, and that's one element I see with many cultures throughout the world. Whereas the Germans, the Irish, the Jews, they all seem to produce something, right? Um, I think post post um, slavery, pre integration or assimilation. I think there may have been the developing of a culture. I see things passed down from one generation to the next, and building it. But I, w- I would say ever since the integration or assimilation um, into a Amer- pop culture in America and the absorb- absorbing the, the, what the media wants to feed you and, and pass down. That I would say there, uh, there's no evidence of there being a culture in a traditional sense. But I love what you've laid out these these four elements that you borrowed yourself, right? Um, or that you're developing. That that there's a right, there's a tradition that's passed down. There's elders whose responsibility is to pass it down, and there's piety. But how do we think about this in the Catholic? context how how, how's the interplay with here with between culture and religion well i i'm glad you brought out the 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 struggles of the black family essentially in the united states especially because it, it shows exactly what is the natural law inclination to establish a culture you have you have the efforts in the 60s for for black communities to establish you know you have malcolm x who's saying I don't have a culture, basically. I don't have an ancestry. I have X, you know, for my name. You have Alex Haley going after the roots. You have Kwanzaa sort of being created as sort of a an amalgamation of trying to get at some African roots. I think of uh, African Bombada even with the hip-hop culture, yeah. trying to create a religion, basically. So there's yeah. this struggle, and this is what every people, especially people who have been a, attacked in their fundamental culture, which is just, you know, slavery is just an attack on the black family, basically. Um, and then, like you said, it just gets commoditized and it's been uh, commercialized. So it's just, yeah. just more destruction, basically. No recovery of the culture. But I think what, what we need to look at is we need to look at the Catholic civilizations that were built in the Americas. You have the French, Spanish, and the Portuguese. Okay. And you have a, a completely different situation. If you just look at the history of New Orleans, you have uh, three different races. Or you can look at uh, Florida, the Seminole Indians. You have different races who are all united around a cultus, which is a Catholic faith. And then you have an amelioration of the church wasn't able to convince all of their impious sons who were enslaving, you know, Pope was condemning slavery from the 1400s, as you're aware. Um, So the church wasn't able to convince them to stop slavery, but at least they could uh, ameliorate their condition. And Mm -hmm. that was what created the free uh, the free people of color out of New Orleans, and this is what creates uh, when you have one cultus, when you have one religion, and you unite in this one culture. Then naturally, the generations blend together, and they create a new a new culture, a new people, and okay. um, so they start marrying each other. This is what happens: <laughs> is you start you start having mixed races, and you know yeah. when you marry each other, it's hard to. Uh, when you have a public marriage ceremony that's publicly accepted by the community, that's much different than 
you know, what was going on in, in the slave United States. You have uh, the Métis, the, the French Indian race of, the, of uh, Canada and America. You know, you, you have this, this is what this Catholic cultist, the Catholic culture okay. is what really solves the issues of America. Uh, you know, that United States has been trying to struggling to solve. It's the answer is the Catholic faith. Hmm. Wow. So in, in the Catholic faith, I think you also see just this, this element of being able to pass down. Uh, you see this in the sacraments, right? I think, I think in the Catholic faith, I think is is just, is culture. It, it has all the elements there to continue to pass down the culture and the tradition. And it has the elders who are responsible. When I think, when this is what I think about when I look at the sacraments, right? The sacraments in the Catholic church, they're, their way by which the, the, our faith is passed down from one generation to the next through these rituals, through the liturgy. And each generation participates in this handing down of faith in these rites and these, in these um, rituals. And in that way, the faith is passed down, but you're saying that even outside of the faith itself, cultures outside um, who, 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 who accept the Catholic faith, they're able to, pass down other elements what are some of these other elements yeah uh, i mean it's everything tradition is everything that's passed down and so there's a lot of other uh factors like i think that um music is one of the most okay. potent one in the americas i think especially when you look so for example i think of afro-cuban music is very different than the haitian music and that's because the Afro-Cuban, you can see the, the Indian and Spanish influence mixing with the African. And okay. so there's, there's a, a beautiful melding of the musical style. And then you have New Orleans, of course. New Orleans jazz, the, the uh, legacy there, which is much earlier than what came out of the 20th century. But um, music is, is one of the biggest, I think, in the Americas that gets passed down um, but we want to make a distinction here because in the 20th century, once again, there's been a, a co total commoditization of music. And so it's, it's not about culture. It's, it's not about passing down these songs of our ancestors. It's not about, you know, having folk music where we sing, you know, the Irish, I think of the Irish music, you know, bringing together a people in their music to struggle against the radical regime in London. What happens in the 20th century is that, the music industry just wants to create profit. And that right. means just creating a, creating a new thing, a new exciting musical style, whatever, especially if it's sexualized for the next generation. And then mm. that's what they do on and on and on. And that's not cultural music. That's just sort of this amalgamization of a fad basically. Um, so, but music I think is one of the biggest things that gets passed down. Yeah. And if you just tuned in, this is the David O. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network. I'm talking about Timothy S. Flanders here, um, who is um, talking to us about culture. And there's a lot to still unpack here, and I hope you tune, keep tuning in. And we'll be back right after this short break at the bottom of the hour here. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about this idea of how um, commercialization or commodization has really played a key role into what Timothy is calling an anti-culture now in the United States. I'll see you again. In on the Guadalupe Radio Network. In the studio now, we've been talking, we've been speaking with Mr. Timothy S. Flanders, who's the editor-in-chief of Our Lady of Victory Press. And he produces the, all the content and media that you find at the Meaning of Catholic Postulate. And we're in the studio now talking about culture. And before the break, um, Timothy, you were talking about how you believe the United States has an anti-culture. And I'd like you to really explain that. What's the evidence that you have based upon the four points? The four points, again, for those who are just tuning, tuning in, that, that culture can be the, the, the key marks or indicators of, of culture is that one it has a cultist. Um, that has cultural rights, it has tradition, it has elders who are responsible for passing down the tradition, and it has piety. I think you're saying that's of the youth who they respect the traditions, um, they respect the culture. 
And so based upon those points, what are some, what are some key indicators that the United States, we, there's no such thing as an American culture? Because I think that's a, a pretty profound point. I think most people would be like, what? Yeah, well, American, the American Revolution was an attempt to safeguard the Whig Revolution of 1688. So it was, in a sense, a conservative revolution, which was attempting to prevent further monarchical power. But the problem is that the Whig Revolution from 1688 is itself an anti-Catholic revolution to prevent the ascension of James II. And all of that is going all the way back to St. Thomas More rebuking Henry VIII. Because when St. Thomas More rebukes Henry VIII, he says, you're breaking Magna Carta. That's our culture, is basically what he's saying. The culture is the, the king makes a vow to his nobles. He makes a vow to the church. The church is offering up the cultists. And you, you get these monuments in, in medieval England. You have our leader of Walsingham, Walsingham. You have uh, St. Thomas Beckett. These are suppressed by Henry VIII. That's anti-culture. He, he destroys the monuments of our fathers. He destroys these things to try to impose his will on the people. And this is the, the debate that's been going on in England ever since. And finally, in 1688, they sort of safeguarded themselves away from Catholicism. And the American Revolution was just sort of a continuation of that. Uh, Anti-Catholicism was a big factor. The Declaration of Independence actually condemns Catholicism. Many people don't know this. It condemns the Quebec Act which was when the British crown allowed Quebec to establish Catholicism in Quebec. It is stated in the Quebec Act. It's stated more explicitly in the results from 1774. But when you have that attitude, you have the attitude of rebellion against hierarchy, rebellion against uh, the ancestors, and also ultimately Catholicism, well, there's an anti-culture there. Uh, the, the federal government was did not have a cultus, so there was no established church, but the state churches did. But what you have in the history of, of the United States is that this momentum kind of flows from the federal government so that the state churches eventually just sort of disintegrate. And Protestantism, as we know, just sort of disintegrates. This is a perfect example of anti-culture because Protestantism just breaks up as the generation go on. There's just more and more splinters, more and more splinters, on and on and on. And this is just Protestantism, the history of Protestantism splitting is just an example, sort of a, a, a religious example of what culturally and socially happens in America. Every new generation just splits off of the new generation. It just becomes more and more disintegrated. And another important example is that immigrant cultures lose their culture mm -hmm. in America, unless they're, unless they're very, very isolated and they're very intentional about it. Very, some, some do, like I think of uh, Chinese, Jews, um, other, other cultures that have really kept themselves together. They can, but if they start to mix around with the, 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 the outside world, they, they learn English, they lose their own language, they quickly lose their culture. Mm -hmm. And this is what many immigrant families have, have struggled with because they're trying to pass down their culture, but they lose their culture. Yeah, would you say so? Since the Catholic Church seems to be primarily throughout the world the leading institution, at least homogenous, in helping the world sustain a culture by passing down the tradition from one generation to the next, what type of movements? I know you mentioned Protestantism, but I want you to build upon that some more. Along with Protestantism, what are some other movements that just seem to be? Because um, it sounds like what you're saying is that every movement that um, seems to be attacking culture is attacking the Catholic Church. Is that is that fair? I would say yes, um, because really the Catholic Church is the, the fulfillment of all cultures. I think this is this is where you really see the difference is when you see um, manifest destiny in the United States history, which is basically taking from Whig history in England and it's transferring it to, into an American ideology, which is that America is the greatest country on earth. So Thomas Paine said there's been more freedom that's been given to this human act. If it can be called human uh, more than any human history, any, anything in human history, you know, th this idea of America being this new, new age of the world. So then 
what are we going to do? We're going to take the land and we're going to conquest to the West and we're going to civilize. And what we mean by civilize is to make everyone an American, to have our polity, have our own customs. I think when you look at the Indian schools is when you really see the difference because the Catholic church, the Jesuits, uh, other orders, you know, they would go, especially these Indian tribes, which are, are all separate tribes, especially you see this in, in Canada. They're all separate tribes with separate languages. And a lot of them are quite distinct and they, they go back centuries. And so you have Jesuits who go in and they preserve their language. They, 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 it's a total oral culture. They learn the language and then they transfer that into a written grammar, which helps them preserve their language. Now, this is in contrast, of course, with the U.S. government, which promoted the Indian schools, which is where they were. The Indians were forced to uh, cut their hair, stop, you know, saying their language. And, but yeah. this was their idea of civilized. That was their idea of civilized. The Catholic idea of civilized is you keep your culture and we perfect your culture. We we cleanse it of any demonic elements. We give you the true king. This is what uh, St. Jerome Bobeuf in Huron Carol says. He's mighty gets you Manitou who is, is coming with his son, is, is, you know, the chief, the chieftain. And this is what perfects your culture. And this is what uh, it does not threaten who you are because the peoples, all these cultures have been passed down since Adam. They've just been corrupted with demons. So they just, we just need to remove the demonic elements keep all the culture and the language and all the great things about that people and introduce them to the true king. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. Um, one of the things, you know, one of my arguments, you know, bounce, go back for just a moment ago before the break. And if you're just tuning in again, this is the David O'Grace show voicing truth and reason on Guadalupe Radio Network. Speaking of it's Mr. Timothy S. Flanders here, editor in chief of our lady victory press and a producer of all the content you find at the meaning of Catholic apostolate. And so we're talking about culture and why the concept is important to talk about, define, and how it integrates perfectly in, in, um, in, the, in the Catholic understanding of how we pass down the faith. And to bounce back for a minute ago, remember I was talking about how, you know, I would, I've been arguing for a short amount of time how now, now how there's no such thing as a black culture in the United States. And again, I was looking how the black community lacks, it lacks community, um, it lacks something they produce. But one of the things that I, I think the points that I was starting to build until I ran into your four points was that youth find that language is very important in, in, in culture. And in as much as I would argue that during slave times, I think there is an a African culture somehow that's in place. There, there seems to be a culture amongst the slaves, those in slavery. Uh, they did not have a language, right? They had a, a way of doing things, a way of speaking, a lot of illiteracy, right? Most people are illiterate, but they had some sort of body language and song and yeah, and, and doing things like things like um, that, and passing down the traditions within the, their communities. But why is language important? And talk more about language and culture. Yeah, language is is it's so important. Um, well, language is what enables thought to be expressed. It allows us to think something abstractly, and then expressing it in language is what sort of incarnates that into a, a reality so that you can communicate it with someone else. And what God showed us in Pentecost is that he does not want the peoples to all speak one language as they once did before Babel. He wants them all to speak the same logos, the same Jesus Christ, but with the beauty of different languages because every language can express the different aspects of God and of the same truth. And this is something that is shown in particular with the Greco-Roman culture, because it was a perfect blending of the Latin mind, Latin language, and then the Greek language. And these produced different sort of Weltanschauung or, or worldviews. So the Latin mind was very much administrative, unity, uh, that type of thing. That's the Latin mind. But the Latin mind could not produce 
Plato and Sophocles and Aristophanes and all this cult, this truth, goodness, and beauty that was among the Greeks. The Greeks were the ones who made the plays and all the, the you know, the temples and all that. So the Latin mind took the Greek mind, which was all the truth, goodness, and beauty, and simply governed it. And that, and that melt, that wedding of Latin and Greek, that was the body into which was poured the soul of Christian culture to vivify the whole Christendom right there. Um, but you see this in particular with the, the schism between the Greeks and the, and the West is because the Greeks lose Latin, and that's the key. The Greeks lose Latin after Justinian in the 500s, and they lose because in the history of the Greeks, they were all at war with each other. They never were able to unite, except under Alexander, but then even after his, right after his uh, death, they all divided again. So they, they, the Greek mind is just not, not administrative. It's just simply not part of their culture. Their greatness of their culture is truth, goodness, and beauty. And so when they lost Latin, they, they found themselves unable to unite with the West, and they, they developed a very tribal mindset. And this was also present in the West, to be fair, as well. But the West always was renewing that Latin and Greek union. And that is so important to all of Christian theology, all of Christian culture, Latin and Greek together, both working together in those two interdependent ways. Yeah. It reminds me of something I heard from uh, Thomas Sowell. He, he talked about how that diversity isn't a strength and you know in today's societies you have a lot of corporations you have you have the government saying oh we have to be diverse we have to diversify with people and we have to bring everybody in as if diversity is something is something good in in itself but thomas soul he talked about how diversity there's nothing in diversity that that's good in in itself but what comes out of diversity when cultures blend and they meet one another if they work through their difficulties and they discover each one's what each culture has to offer out of that the um, uh, cultures can produce great things together but just being diverse for diversity's sake doesn't 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 do much but 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 given that the history of the world whenever cultures meet one another there tends to be problems, oftentimes bloodshed, right? Culture <laughs> throughout the history of the world, we've had a bloody histories of, of cultures coming in counter with one another and things just not working out, right? The Bosnians and the Serbs recently, right? Not too many years ago, bloodshed, right? Um, but but how does what what's what's how does culture when does it work, right? What give some examples of uh of when does it work? the best well that that's a that's a great question and that that um yes that's been sort of the question for um uh, the dawn of time um and i think that when it really works that that's you really only see it truly working when a universal culture makes everyone by bil- at least bilingual so you have a lingua franca that you use for all the administration econo- economy and everything and then you have your own pers- your own sort of tribal language or your own local language and uh, when people lose bilingualism I think that's the first step towards bloodshed because when you don't have the language of someone then you're not able to understand them you don't think like them you don't understand why they think the way they do yeah. And you can't understand what's going on. So the Roman Empire, and also even the Persians and the, and the Greeks did this too, but the genius of the Roman Empire on a very on a natural level was that it was able to, one, the, meld the Latin and Greek cultures, first of all, but it will also sort of accepted every local culture and assimilated them into a universal Latin structure. And this was simply the, the f- natural foundation for Christendom, so that this only works in Christendom where you have bilingualism. There is a mm-hmm. universal language that connects all these peoples in a, in a given region. And then you have all these local dialects. So, um, and this of course is most acutely shown in Christendom of the West, where you have numerous barbarian tribes 
They all speak different languages. People need to understand that, you know, in France, people didn't speak French, all speak French, quote unquote, French as we know it today, until much later, 1700 maybe, uh, later, 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 when they start to impose a lingua franca and they oppose, they oppose bilingualism. Because before that, you had the French of the court, and then you had the local French dialects that were very different right. from each other. Right. And you also have the Latin, of course. The Latin is what combines them all um, into one administration. And so you have this bilingualism. But then when you, when you have the rise of the secular state, and this is, this is anti-culture. This is exactly what, what we mean. After the American Revolution, the French Revolution, etc., you have more and more an imposition of one lingua franca. You have the rise of extreme nationalism, which is exalting this particular nation as the greatest nation or just the Germans as bad or the French as bad or whatever. Mm. And then they lose the other person's language. And that's especially when you, we, we, we saw the greatest bloodshed in the history of the world in the 20th century. And it's, that, is the, that is a key part of that i think when you lose the other person's language now i, I mean in america we all speak english uh right. and there's you know the hispanics often will be speaking spanish and right. and uh english but in, as far as anglos my, myself almost none of us know any other language but english so it makes sense that we're myopic and we don't understand the way that <laughs> this other people w- understand the world because we only speak english we only speak one language yeah yeah so the arrogance of it all, right? <laughs> but um, but commercialization and commoditization, right? Again, I, I want to go back to, you know, the, to the idea of sort of starting to develop before I encountered your, your thesis here was that what I saw with, with black Americans post, you know, after, you know, the coming to the welfare state and after this compelled into integration um, and people thought the good life was to live, move out of their community, which is essential to culture, move out of their community into another community that wasn't like theirs. Right. What I, what I saw was that as they were assimilated, what began to take over was the commercialization and this idea that every five to 10 years, corporations and media will tell you what your culture is, what it looks like, what to listen to, what to wear, how to speak. And so it seems like every five to 10 years and in, 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 in with black Americans, we have a different trend, you know, different, you know, what we call pop culture. And we seem to define that, Oh, that's culture. No, that's commercialization, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th- this is, lamentably it is it is uh a a great an infamous example of this very thing with black culture in america because you first have if you read the uh, malcolm x he talked about this if you read him he talks about how uh essentially you have first of all you have the catholic culture of new orleans which is catholic it's catholic because it was black and french and later spanish and english all mixing together freely organically. This is just happening organically. People are meeting people on the street. You have free blacks and you have the slave blacks. The free blacks, some of the free blacks have slaves. It's, it's, uh, it is a melding that is not being orchestrated by the government and it's not being orchestrated by big business. It's just something where people are getting together and it's creating, and we don't know a, a lot about the Catholic, maybe jazz. I don't know if we call it proto jazz, but, because it's, it's been lost to history, but you know, the, and I mean, you see this kind of in Afro Cuban music and other music that have survived, but there's sort of a melding. So there's an authentic culture that's growing and it takes time. It takes many years and generations for that to yeah. meld and develop. Yeah. Now profit, when you want profit now, you don't care about the next generation. You don't care about the children growing up. All you care about is profit. So, what happens in the jazz age is that you have the, the commercialization of jazz to such a large degree. So Malcolm X talked about how the, uh, they did, the world discovered New Orleans jazz, and they started to commoditize it. And then you have blacks and whites just trying to make more money 
And then you have the Prohibition era, which is – this is the first sexual revolution, actually, which leads up to the contraception condemnation of Pius XI, 1930. Um, this is when you have a huge revolt in, in sexual morals in the 1920s, and it's, and it's being – uh, orchestrated and, and pushed on by profits and money because the more you sexualize it, the more money you make. Wow. That's, that's the way it is. And so, and then you have every new generation. You have 1940. The hit song was uh, celebrating committing adultery or fornicating uh, by an artist in 1940. And, and then you have rock and roll. And every new generation is more sexualization and more... Uh, elements that just make more money. I, I think that one of the most conspicuous examples of this is Africa Mabata in 1973. So he founds the Universal Julu Nation, and he founds hip-hop culture, which is actually supposed to be an actual culture. It's, it's the attempt of a black American to connect with his roots and restore something that should have been there. But what do you see with hip-hop today? It's completely just uh, worshiping money, yeah. uh, Totally, and it's very, it is very anti-culture yeah. because it's promoting yeah. sexuality outside of right. marriage. And if you don't have family, you don't have, <laughs> you don't have the elders. The past, I mean, it's just the, like you said, the, the sexual revolution is it, that's that's even you know I don't like the word revolution because that's what it is. It's truly a revolution in a bad sense. But then it 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 again is anti-culture. But well, I think we have my producer Cecil is telling me, David, you have two minutes left. Okay, thanks, Cecil. Um, so, Cecil's awesome, by the way. Have you ever, have you ever met Cecil? You talked to her on the phone. Yeah, I did. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, <laughs> but um, we've got two minutes left. Um, what are what are what's dangerous about anti culture? Like, what's what's the effects? Why is it bad? Where is it going to lead America? Well, the worst thing is that it's hard to raise our children in the faith and keep them in the faith because anti culture is pressing on them to just rebel against their parents so we're trying to inculcate in them something and pass it down but even just the taste even these little things you know the taste of music you know the next generation wants the different types of music and doesn't like the taste of music from from the prior generations um the danger is creating a stable healthy catholic civilization in the united states it's 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 really it's been, I mean, I think it was done in certain pockets for some time, but all of these pockets have essentially been erased eventually um, in certain, not, Southwest is far more with the Hispanic culture, much more strong over there, but uh, where I'm at in the Midwest or New England, um, especially with immigrant communities, it's very difficult to continue that. There are basically these pockets of Catholic civilization, but that's the danger of anti-culture is that it's very difficult to create that for our children. Wow. Yeah. Speaking with Timothy S. Flanders here from, you can find him. Why don't you speak for yourself? Where can they find you online? Sure. Uh, meaning of Catholic.com is our website with all of our stuff linked on there. Take a look. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Hope to hear more from your, your work, Timothy. Looking forward to, thanks for coming on to the show. So we'll be back next week, same time, same place. And I look forward to conversing with you again. In the between time, you can visit me at davidlgray.info. But until then, until next time, remember that Jesus loves you and is there for you. And live your life like salvation matters. And may the abundance of our Lord's blessings and graces and favors fall upon you and yours. Thank you. <laughs>